Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we want to welcome you to our first webinar of the year, um, School Nurse Leadership, Tackling Absenteeism. We're so excited that you could all join us um, and hope you enjoy this webinar today. Um, my name is Christy Cox, and I'm the Training and Program Manager at Healthy Schools Campaign, which is the organization that's hosting today's webinar. We'll tell you a little bit more about Healthy Schools Campaign in a couple of minutes. Um, but first, I want to walk you through a few basics about today's uh, webinar. Um, we would love for you to be part of the conversation today, and there's a couple simple ways you can do that. You can follow us at Healthy Schools for the latest on our uh, school's environment and education. Um, and you can also tweet us at um, SNLA to share your thoughts and um, any, any findings you might learn today from the webinar. Um, we'll also be posting today's webinar and presentations, um, including additional resources. So let's go through some of the logistics for today. Our webinar will run for about one hour, um, and we'll, we'll have a recording available for everyone to, re to view. Um, we'll make that available in the next few days. Um, we'll also email a link to the recording, and it'll be uh, archived on the Healthy Schools Campaign website in the next week or so. Um, also, at the end of the webinar, if you could take a moment to please complete a quick survey about the webinar, we'd really appreciate it. It should only take you about one minute. We'll also hold about 15 minutes towards the end for question and answers. Um, and we really want to hear from you. So these questions and answers, uh, these questions should be directed towards your speakers. And um, if you could ask your questions by typing into the questions box, which is located on your control panel, and click on the send button. You can send those questions throughout the webinar, and then we'll hold those questions at the end, um, and then have our panelists answer those questions for you. We have a full lineup today. Um, we have Alex Mays joining us from Healthy Schools Campaign, Eva Stone uh, with the Lincoln County Schools in Stanford, Kentucky, and Kelly Grenham from Mapleton Public Schools in Denver, Colorado. So um, quite the diverse lineup, and hopefully you'll, you'll find this presentation interesting today. Um, we're going to quickly thank our sponsors. We, um, we really appreciate MAKO and School Health for sponsoring uh, both the webinar and the School Nurse Leadership Award Program, um, so want to recognize them quickly. So I'm going to turn this time over to Alex Mays. She's our senior policy analyst here at Healthy Schools Campaign, and she manages the School Nurse Leadership Program. And um, yeah, Alex, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Christy, and um, welcome to everybody that's joining us on today's webinar. So as Christy said, my name is Alex Mays. I'm the senior policy analyst at Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, I am honored to be speaking today with two wonderful leaders, um, school nurse leaders, who were are recipients of our School Nurse Leadership Award. Um, Healthy Schools Campaign has been running our School Nurse Leadership Award um, for three years now. Um, we recognize up to five winners each year, um, and both Kelly and Eva won the 2015 award. So they are our stars today, and um, I will just be giving a quick overview of Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, and some of our work around school nurse leadership, so we can be sure to give them plenty of time to share the wonderful work that they're leading. Um, so just a little bit about Healthy Schools Campaign, for those of you who aren't familiar with our work. Uh, Healthy Schools Campaign is a nonprofit based in Chicago, and we work at the local, state, and national levels to promote healthy schools and healthy students. All of our work is based on the simple and common sense notion that healthy students are better learners, and that health and wellness really should be incorporated into every aspect of the school experience. Our work in Chicago focuses on training school stakeholders, which includes parents, teachers, principals, and school nurses to be champions for change in their school health and wellness environment. And then we then build on those lessons that we learn from those wonderful changes that our stakeholders are leading to advocate for district, state, and federal policy changes to create healthier school environments for kids across the country. Next slide. So Healthy Schools Campaign, um, a key component of our work is increasing access to school health services. And we fully recognize the critical role that school nurses play in a healthy school environment. Um, so for the past 10 years, 
uh, elevating school nurse leadership and providing school nurses with training um, and information around how they can be champions for health and wellness at schools has been a core component of our work. Um, we previously ran a school nurse leadership training program um, that began about 10 years ago and ran for six years. Um, the program, unfortunately, no longer is, is going on, but through that program, we were able to train over 300 school nurses um, in Illinois, in Colorado, in Kentucky, in New York. Um, and for us, it just uh, really brought to attention um, the key role that school nurses play um, in leading health and wellness in their school. And we learned about all the incredible things school nurses um, are doing, which really led us to want to know how we can address, as an organization, some of the barriers that are preventing access to school nurses and school health services. Um, so while we no longer run our school nurse leadership training program, um, we do continue to advocate for changes in local, state, and federal policy to increase access to and resources for school health services delivered by school nurses um, and by other school health providers. So for example, one of the key issues that Healthy Schools Campaign has been working on um, for the past five years is an issue called the free care policy. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the free care policy um, was a barrier that was in place that um, said that Medicaid reimbursement couldn't be received um, for services delivered to Medicaid enrollees if their services were free to an entire community. Um, and so for schools, that meant that many of the uh, services being delivered by school health providers uh, could not be reimbursed for Medicaid, which really led to lack of funding for school health services. Um, and we saw it um, through our work as a major barrier to increasing access to school nurses. So fortunately, um, actually in December 2014, so about a year ago, um, there was a decision made by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that removed the free care policy as a barrier. Um, and while we still have some work to do to implement that change, um, it's a big step forward in terms of accessing more resources for the health services delivered by school nurses and other school health providers. Uh, Healthy Schools Campaign also has a really robust communications program around school nursing. Um, we have a school nurse newsletter, which we will include, we have a link to subscribe to momentarily. Um, we post regular blogs, and um, we also host regular webinars, which you all are participating in today. Next slide. Um, and another key component of Healthy Schools Campaign's work is our School Nurse Leadership Award. Um, as I mentioned, both Kelly and Eve, our two presenters today, um, are past winners from the 2015 School Nurse Leadership Award. Um, through our School Nurse Leadership Program, again, we saw the key role that school nurses are playing in creating healthier school environments and wanted to be able to recognize the incredible work that school nurses are doing across the country. Um, so we launched the School Nurse Leadership Award three years ago. Um, and it really focuses on recognizing school nurses um, that are demonstrating these four key principles of embracing evidence-based practice, demonstrating ability to work within lead groups, support policy changes, and build teams to make changes related to school health. Um, next slide. So we um, have been doing this award again for three years. We've been um, had about 50, or had more than 50 actually applications per year. So it's been wonderful to learn about work going on across the country. We've even had applications come in from Department of Defense schools in Japan, which is incredible. Um, this year's application will be launching on February 9th, um, and will be due, February, uh, will be due March 8th. Um, and again, we'll be selecting up to five winners, and each winner will receive a $500 school health gift card, um, in addition to recognition through our blog and communications um, and the chance to join us for, for webinars like these. So um, if you know a school nurse, if you are a nurse um, that you think should be recognized through this award, we encourage you to apply. Um, you can apply for yourself. You can apply on behalf of someone else. Um, and again, that application will be locked on February 9th. Next slide. And these are just two links. Again, I mentioned our, um, what our newsletter, Healthy Schools Campaign's newsletter. So you can subscribe to that newsletter here. And the uh, second link is sign up to receive an email once that School Nurse Leadership Award application is live. Um, so I will now turn it back over to Christy, who's going to introduce our first speaker. 
Thanks, Alex. Um, really helpful information. I hope all of you are able to uh, connect with Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so our first presenter today is Eva Stone. Um, again, she's from Lincoln County Schools in Stanford, Kentucky. She was one of our 2015 School Nurse Leadership Award winners. Um, and we're really excited to have her uh, present her findings on um, some of the work she's done in Kentucky. So I'll hand that over to you, Eva. Thank you, Christy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, next slide, please. My name is Eva Stone, and I'm a nurse practitioner, family nurse practitioner, and my role is Director of Student Support Services in Lincoln County, Kentucky. And so some of those responsibilities include our school health program, our school nurses, our family resource and youth service centers, which are unique um, to Kentucky. I think maybe there's a few other states that have this program, but we have staff in place who um, are here to help meet some of the social needs of families and reduce barriers to learning, uh, help with migrant education program, and then take care of 504 plans for the district. So I've worked in school health for the past 15 years. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Lincoln County. Um, Lincoln County is a rural county in Kentucky. We've got about 4,000 students. We've got lots of farmland. In the area, beautiful countryside. We had lots of snow earlier this week, so we're on our third day with no students because all our back roads aren't able to uh, be cleaned off yet. <laughs> so district-wide, about 70% of our students are eligible for free and reduced lunch, so we've got um, a lot of poverty in the area. And based on 2015 Kids Count data, shows that the county ranks 96th out of our 120 counties in childhood well-being and so um, we definitely have an issue in that area in 2014-15 only half of our fourth graders were reading at grade level next slide please we've got seven uh, registered nurses who cover our 10 schools and um, we have an excellent staff here which is part of what makes my job a lot easier we decided we had some concerns and started looking at chronic absenteeism in the district, which is defined as a student missing at least 10% of school for any reason, excused or unexcused. And I don't know how it is with other places, but we had a big focus um, on the excuses, making sure that students had excuses. But what we noticed is even if they brought in a piece of paper, we had students that were missing 20, 30, 40 days of school a year, and that absolutely has an impact academically. Um, chronic absenteeism is a primary cause of low academic achievement, and it's a very strong predictor of those at risk to drop out of school, and that's something we've worked very hard in this area to improve. When I started in Lincoln County, we had the second highest dropout rate in the state, and so we've done some very good things in the district to overcome that but we still, we still have a long way to go. And then, as most everybody probably knows, there's been a national initiative launched to eliminate chronic absenteeism, which is Every Student Every Day. And that was released in the fall of 2015 by the U.S. Department of Education. Next slide. So it was in 2012 we really started looking at our data because what we noticed is that it was a smaller percentage of students that were accounting for most of the absences. And as we were trying to think of ways to improve student attendance, which has always been an issue in our district, when we really dug into that data, we saw that the, it was the same children missing over and over again. And those were the same children that were receiving, they were an RTI, they were receiving interventions, but really their school attendance was being left out of that equation. And so in 2012, we had about 10%, just over 10% of our students in elementary school who were missing 10% or more of school, and then 15.9% of our middle and high school students. And we have a school that's not included in this data, which is an alternative school in the district, but that's a very different situation, so we didn't include that in the overall data for the district. Next slide, please. So what we did is we developed teams at each school. And those of you work, who work in schools hear um, the PLCs that are going on in your schools and the team meetings. And so we had done all these things academically, but we really hadn't done it for the non 
cognitive things that were causing kids to meet school. So we call them our at-risk teams, our ARP teams, and we develop these teams at each school. And really, the intention was to have the school nurse as the leader of that team. But we also pulled in the principal, the school counselor, our, our friskies as we call them, the coordinator that, for each of the schools, um, our academic coach, which we didn't start out including, but we decided later on that that was an important piece of the puzzle, and then the attendance clerks. And then I try to attend every meeting, and our director of pupil personnel also comes. So we develop a meeting schedule for the year based on the need or the size of the school. Um, our small, our elementary schools typically meet once a month, and our middle and high school, our middle school meets twice a month, and then our high school is large enough that we meet weekly. And we use those teams to discuss students who are at risk, and primarily we look at those who are missing 10% or more of school. So what we do, our student data system is Infinite Campus in Kentucky, and we go into Infinite Campus, and based on what day we are in the school year, we look to see who's at 10% for missing school. And again, we don't care if it's excused or unexcused. That was a real hard sell, um, particularly for our attendance clerks, because their role really is to follow up and um, take action for those students who are truant from school. But we, we're trying very hard to change the culture for those kids to say, we, we don't care whether they're excused or unexcused, they're not here, and that's impacting them academically. Next slide, please. So what these teams do is discuss the students and then decide what barriers kids are facing. So if it's a, a physical health issue, then we might route that to the school nurse. If it's a social issue, we route it to our Family Resource Center, behavioral to a school counselor. We really try and develop a plan to provide wraparound services to those kids based on what needs we identify. Next slide, please. So our overall goal is, is to make sure that students and families have their needed resources and support. And I can tell you, this has been a very um, humbling and eye-opening experience for me because I wasn't as in touch with some of the things that were going on with students and families. But I've been pretty overwhelmed with the number of kids we have who are homeless, um, the number of families who don't have food, the number of students we're feeding on the weekends through a backpack program um, because they just don't have those resources. And so for us to think that those children are going to come to school and be ready to sit in the classroom is not very realistic. So at the very start of the year, before they can be chronically absent, in Kentucky we're able to run from our student data system a report called the Persistent to Graduation Report. And what that does is it pulls data from the student data system and it looks at things like behavior, grades, um, their school attendance, those kinds of issues, and then it will rank those students based on their risk to drop out of school. And so when school starts in the fall, we begin working from that list. So we'll know if we have new students enroll into the district, perhaps from another county in Kentucky, that, that information follows them, so we're able to know, to identify who's at risk. So, from 2012 to 2015, as we've been doing this, the percentage of our chronically absent students has gone from 10.2% to 6.78% at the elementary level, and then down to 12% at our high school and middle school. And I want to say, we set our elementary target at 7%. And I looked and looked and really couldn't find a recommendation of what a good percentage is for what to aim for. But at the time, I was working also in another school district, and um, we were implementing this program there. And they uh, have a much better attendance rate than we saw in Lincoln County. And um, on average there, 7% is what they were having at their elementary school. So that was sort of an arbitrary number, but it was a goal that we set and I will tell you that our, we had an elementary school this past year that had a 2% rate of students that were chronically absent. And it's a smaller school. The attendance clerk is able to make personal phone calls, but I think it's made a big difference. Next slide, please. So the lessons 
that we've learned from this, <clears throat> first of all, student health includes physical, social, and behavioral health. You know, so often we think of health just as physical health, but health is all encompassing, and we have to look at health that way. And school nurses have just been a vital component of that. I work with a, a team of nurses that's absolutely amazing, and um, they've been vital in implementing this and in helping to institute a process to identify and intervene our at-risk um, children. So many times people think of school nurses just as being there to take care of the Band-Aids and boo-boos as we like to say, and it's hard to make the public, and it's even hard to make educators sometimes see and understand the impact that nursing has beyond um, just taking care of those physical ailments. And so if you're not familiar with the National Association of School Nurses framework for 21st century nursing practice, um, it's well worth your time to go to their website and um, take a look at that initiative. And then again, when we took a hard look at the data, we found that it was this, those same children and really putting an intentional focus, targeting what we're doing toward the most at-risk kids um, is having an impact. Next slide, please. So this process continues to evolve in our district. Um, again, as I mentioned, we found that pulling in an academic specialist into those meetings has been very helpful because as we talked about the children, sometimes it is an overwhelming list. Sometimes there's so many kids on there, it's hard to rank order. And so what we try to do is if, if we have a long list of kids that are missing is really prioritize the ones that are struggling. And we look at their academic struggles as um, one of the biggest things that we need to address. And then our plan for next year is to work on a formal referral process so that um, teachers and other staff can do an online document that they'll send so that we're not just looking at attendance for our at-risk kids. We are able to pull in other staff. And with that, uh, next slide. I think we'll have to include your contact information at the end, Eva. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, are there any questions? And then here's my contact information, but it'll come up eventually. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Eva. Okay. That was really great information about chronic absenteeism. I think that um, you've pointed out something that a lot of um, a lot of people in the in in our country don't necessarily think about when it's um, when we look at student health. Um, so that was really helpful information. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Kelly Grenham, and she's from Mapleton Public Schools in Denver, Colorado. Um, we're, uh, again, another 2015 School Nurse Leadership Award winner. We're so thankful to have Kelly um, here to help lead us through her presentation and share some information um, that she's uh, been able to comprise through data. So I'll turn this over to Kelly. Thanks, Christy, um, and Alex, and Eva, and thanks for everyone for um, calling in, tuning in to listen to this this afternoon. So, um, like she said, my name is Kelly Grenham. I've been a registered nurse for 34 years. Um, I'm actually contracted through Children's Hospital Colorado to the Mapleton um, School District as a school nurse, and I've been here for 13 years. Um, currently, I have three schools, so I'm an itinerant nurse. Um, Mapleton is an urban school district in North Denver with a student population of about 6,000 students. Um, we have a um, high rate of families experiencing both economic and health disparities. 68% of our kids receive free and reduced lunch rates. Um, and we also have high rates of um, chronic absenteeism and truancy. So. Um, Working as nurses in educational settings, we need to learn to speak the language of educators, which means graduation and attendance rates, seat times, and test scores. And Eva talked about that too, that we really need to be um, talking their language. So um, in 2009, the Colorado Department of Education received some monies to support nine regional nurse specialists from each region that you see here on the map. Um, another nurse and I worked in the Denver metro area and north central regions to provide professional development for school nurses. Um, and you can't see it on this map, but Colorado, a lot of people think of us as the mountains, which we do, the beautiful mountains, but we also have a lot of uh, plains 
um, and we have an urban corridor that goes right from Colorado Springs up to Fort Collins, and that's where the majority of our population is. So, um, uh, so we decided as the regional nurse specialist the first year to work on asthma at school. Next slide. So it's no surprise that asthma is a leading chronic illness among children and adolescents in the United States. It's also one of the leading causes of school absenteeism. So asthma is a national health issue, and we know that millions of children are identified with asthma. Um, so in order to address managing asthma in schools, the Colorado Asthma Coalition brought together stakeholders from the American Lung Association, National Jewish Hospital, Children's Hospital of Colorado, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, Department of Education, um, other stakeholders, parents of children with asthma, and also teenagers with asthma, bringing everyone together to really talk about what can we do in schools. And from that coalition, um, the regional nurses were also we're working with that coalition to create a standardized Colorado asthma health care plan. Next slide. So you can't see all the details on this slide, but this is um, used throughout Colorado. So um, the big difference between this asthma plan and what we had before is that it addresses um, pretreatment. Um, and you, instead of what we had before, which was a medication authorization allowing um, a student that had asthma symptoms to have two puffs of albuterol every three to four hours. Um, instead, this plan allows um, the student to get two puffs of albuterol every 10 to 15 minutes up to four times. Um, so the old procedure um, really did not often, it frequently did not relieve the symptoms. So um, the student had to leave school, and the parents then, they would miss several days of school because the families really didn't believe the school could manage their child's asthma symptoms. So this new plan really um, is evidence-based, and it is um, designed to keep kids in school. Um, it is also, the plan is designed um, on the standards of care for asthma. Uh, next slide. So the regional nurses um, over the next year uh, did asthma um, health care plan trainings with all of the nurses throughout Colorado. Um, we did went to individual school districts and also at regional workshops. Um, and we did lots of connection between healthy students, healthy learners, um, with a focus on asthma. So the, the hope of the asthma health care plan was that if the students received quick and effective care at school, they could stay at school, not miss multiple days, and hopefully avoid ER visits. Next slide. So um, after we spent the spring going around and talking, oh, the next slide, please. Oh, there it is. After we went, spent the spring talking to school nurses all over Colorado, we decided, wow, we better walk the walk and do this in Mapleton. So um, my coworker and myself, um, designed a new program for getting, and our goal was to have a school asthma plan for every student that was identified with asthma and, um, and to uh, create a new system for this process. Next slide. So in 2009, Mapleton had approximately 5,500 students. And of those 5,500 students, only 29 of them actually had um, asthma health care plans. Um, so these were only students that had very poorly controlled asthma, um, and the, the nurse would have like one-on-one -on -one talks with parents and do asthma education and really focus on these 29 kids. Um, so with the new system, um, we went away from that, and we sent every student that was identified with asthma a blank asthma health care plan, um, and then a cover letter explaining how important it was to have the asthma plan at home, and then offering to work with the families to um, get the provider to sign the plans and make sure that they were complete. So by 2011, there were 163 students in Mapleton with asthma health care plans, and by 2012, there were 230 students with asthma health care plans. So we really um, did a big push. So after we did all of that work, um, the real question is, 
is that our asthma health care plans really impacting student attendance. So if you look at the statistics, three kids out of 30 will have asthma. So really, what, did, what impact did it have on those students? Next slide. So we also have um, Infinite Campus as our uh, student database. So we began um, putting in health condition alerts for every student with asthma um, or asthma health care plan into our system. So my coworker and I met with our IT department. And together we decided um, that the IT department would run reports based on um, students with asthma health condition alerts and gather data on, this stu on these particular students' attendance rates over the last three years, from 2009 to 2012. So um, they, they did the report and gave it to me. I was able to share this data with a Colorado Department of Education statistician in the health and wellness department um, because I did not have the tools to do that, to analyze the data. So when it was given back to me, um, the report said the average rate of absenteeism of students identified with asthma in Mapleton decreased by 13.3% from 2009 to 2012. So although this process didn't start out as an official research project, and I was not able to control any confounding factors. Um, I can't make an absolute link between their attendance rates and the asthma health care plan. But we know that it definitely made an impact. And it was very exciting news to say that our nursing practice could actually have an impact on attendance. Um, so uh, then what's my next, what is my takeaway from this? Um, make new friends. Uh, be nice to your IT department, bribery works, and share your information. Once you get all of this information, you really need to be sharing it with the people in your district um, or even outside of your district. So um, in this case, we looked at asthma, um, but really you could take this example and use it for all kinds of um, nurse practice work that we do um, and just to be thinking about how is what we're doing today impacting attendance, impacting grades, impacting graduation rates. Next slide. So I told you I work for Children's Hospital, and we do collect um, quite a bit of data. Um, and these are kind of, you know, we look at the students, look at their health conditions, what are their delegated procedures, and do we have up-to-date health care plans signed by the parent and um, the provider. So from this uh, very basic information, um, we can uh, create a lot of data, and we can do data um, over the years. So can we have uh, the next slide, please? Uh, I apologize. This slide says Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You can just ignore that. The idea of this slide was to tell you to share your data with administrators and share the year to year. So I now have slides from 2003 all the way up to 2015 to really show them patterns of health um, that are going on um, with students. So um, it's very important for nurses to collect data and to share that data with their administrators. At one point in Mapleton, we had shared so much data, they were like, OK, we get it, we get it, no more data. So um, it's important to make sure that they really can see it. Um, the other thing that has happened um, by sharing data is that from in the last 13 years, we've more than doubled our nursing um, hours. We still are trying to get um, more nursing hours for our students. Um, but really, it doesn't work just to tell our administrators that we're very busy. Um, but if we show them data, then it really makes a difference. And I would encourage you to gather this data and share it in February or March, because at least in my school district, they're doing budgets in February, March, and April. So we really need to have that data. Initially, when I first offered it, I was offering all this information in June. But at that point, the budget was made, and um, there was uh, no time to be able to really look at what we needed. So um, next slide. Oh, I had a next slide that also had questions, but I guess we'll do it at the end. So thank you uh, very much for letting me share my um, story. And good luck to all the school nurses out there doing their best. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was great information. Um, I hope that all of you found that 
um, relevant. I know that asthma is a, is a big issue with a lot of students and um, definitely contributes to absenteeism. And so um, hopefully some of that information will help allow you as nurses, empower you to um, address those concerns at, at your school. So uh, I'm going to hand this back over to Alex. She's been collecting a lot of questions that have been coming through from our listeners. Um, and we really thank you so much for uh, posing some of these questions. They're very relevant. And um, I think that our two uh, experts, our school nurse experts, will be able to help you with some of this information. So Alex, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Great. Thanks, Christy. And um, wonderful presentations by Eva and Kelly. It's just um, fantastic to learn more about the work that you both are leading um, and really hear more about you're using data to drive the decisions and programming that you're implementing. Uh, so we have had a lot of questions come in. Um, they, we have a good amount of time for our Q&A. So um, for the participants that are listening in, please feel free to um, continue to send in those questions. And we will work through them. Um, so first question I'm going to send to Eva. Um, people, I think, are, are very curious to know um, more about what you found out through, through your programming and, and kind of the, the research that you did into chronic absenteeism. Um, were you able, what were some of the, the leading causes of chronic absenteeism that you saw in your work? Well, really, in our area, um, there just seems to be a culture that doesn't value um, the education. It's just not important. And um, we have actually been able to get a lot of community partners on board because that doesn't just translate to school. That translates to life. Kids that don't come to school don't go to work. That impacts whether businesses will relocate to our community. And um, of course, if kids aren't successful in finishing school, that has a major impact on the local economy and the community. So some of our biggest barriers really are just an, an apathy about the importance of sending kids to school. We have a, a high percentage of children that are being raised by somebody other than their parents. Um, we have a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's a poor area. And as with, with any area that's poverty stricken, we have our issues with drug abuse. And so um, those social factors impact whether children are coming to school or not. Now, a lot of that is couched in um, health. It's couched in, well, he didn't feel good. He, it's couched in, but what we try and do is make sure that those parents understand, you know, if, if your child isn't running a fever, doesn't, just doesn't feel good, send him to school. Let's let the school nurse do an assessment and see what's going on. And we really promote doing the, the individual health plans, um, and those sorts of things. We also have a, a mindset. Um, local providers a lot of times will encourage um, children to miss school for things like anxiety and depression. And we've really been working hard to overcome that as a reason for absence, too. So really having these ma meetings has, has have brought a lot of those issues to light. Great. And a follow-up question to that um, is people wanting a little additional information on what some of the services you um, referred, referred students to after identifying that they were missing too much school? Well, if it's um, health related, a lot of times we, what we'll do is have parents sign release of information and we'll com release of information forms and communicate directly with the health care providers so that we, we are on the same page when it comes to developing a health plan and um, providing care for children while they're at school. And sometimes it's reassuring the parents that that care is going to be provided. Um, we do home visits a lot, particularly with our family resource centers, when we really can't determine what the reason is the children are missing. And so um, either the school nurse or school counselor, the family resource center person, there'll be a couple of folks that go to the home to get an idea of what's going on. A lot of times um, that's incentive enough for parents to go on <laughs> and their kids. The home visits aren't always well received, even though they're not intended to be a punitive thing. Um, but we try to actually go see what condition they're living in and then assess for ourselves what we think some of the needs are and what the issues are where they're not getting to school. Sometimes kids have parents that aren't waking them up in the morning. Sometimes we're providing the kids themselves with alarm clocks and things like that just to try and encourage school attendance. Great, thank you so much. Um, next question is for Kelly. Um, 
Someone wanting to know, what was the rate of return on the plan sent to parents, and how many attempts did you make to get plans from parents? So um, the, initially, when we were trying this, we mailed them all out. And um, that doesn't work very well. Uh, we only got like 10 to 20 percent. So instead, we had um, at registrations on back to school nights, um, we have health assistants in the building, and they would have a table with the asthma plans and the allergy plans and have the parents go ahead and sign there. And that actually, we could get like 60% of the kids right there. Um, and it really depends on um, the relationship. Like if you have a health assistant at one school that's been there for a while, has been working with families, um, then she has a much higher rate of the health care plans coming back then if you have um, a brand new person or um, they're unable to do evening, uh, you know, for the back to school nights. Um, so it, it, it is a, a variety. Um, I think just mailing them home um, is not the best way. Um, and I, I, I don't, I couldn't give you like an exact, um, exact number, but I can tell you we kind of do a three strikes you're out. So, um, you know, we try uh, at the back to school night and maybe they'll go home in a packet with the, with the grades and then um, when we do our immunizations, they might get another one. So, but then after that, um, it's up to them. We also have, give the parents an option to do, um, if they don't want meds at school, um, then we do give them an, an option for that as well. Great, thanks. And, and one follow-up question based on something you said um, in your presentation. Someone wanted to know if you could restate the absenteeism decrease um, from 2009 to 2012. 13.3. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, a question that I think both of you, I'm sure, could share insight into. There are a lot of people wanting to know about how parents were involved in your work. And I think Kelly, you, you just did a nice job of, of sharing some information about that. Um, Eva, can you speak a little bit about kind of the, the engagement or work that you did with parents um, and just how you communicated with them? Because as you, as you said, very often um, there are obstacles that our family face, families are facing in getting kids to school. Um, so there's certainly a need to think about how to address those obstacles. So any insights you can share about parent engagement would be appreciated. Well, our intention is never to start out um, in a punitive fashion with the parents because no matter what's going on, uh, most of the time it's the child that needs support and so we need to figure out how to make that happen. So we, we always start with trying to give the benefit of the doubt. In a couple of our schools, of course, we've got some, we've got small elementary schools. So in our district, there's 10 schools and in, um, Two of those schools, the attendance clerks actually make personal phone calls home when students are absent. And uh, I mentioned that we had one school that had a 2% um, rate of children who were chronically absent. And I attribute that a lot um, to her making personal phone calls. She knows the families. A lot of times the families will call her when a child has to miss. The other thing is, is trying to do some systemic incentives for, for students to be at school. So. We try to talk about the importance of being at school and, and reward kids um, for their attendance, but really communicate to parents that the, the message, if they're not here, they don't learn. Um, our funding in Kentucky is based on attendance, and so for a long time people would just say, well, you're, you're just afraid, um, you're going to lose your money. And it, it's trying to communicate the messages, no, it, the, it, the basic takeaway is if they're not here, they don't learn. And, and there are very few parents who really don't want their child to be successful, and so if, if we can communicate that um, in that manner. We even had some providers um, in the area that would say, all you care about is, is your budget. This is just all about the budget, and I would say, you know, you can't run a clinic on no-shows, and, and we can't run a school district on no-shows. That, that's true, and you wouldn't run a business that way, but by the same token, a child 100% of the time will not learn if they're not there. And so when we work on communicating that message, it makes a difference. Great. I think that's so important both on the parent side and also in terms of engaging education around you know, why, why health services are so important um, 
and really making that connection to, to attendance and having kids in their seats and learning. So thanks for sharing that. Um, a question for Kelly, wanting to know um, how, this, how Colorado received funding for the regional nurse consultants, and if it was federal funding, um, and if so, what, what entity? Um, it was the Colorado Health Foundation um, gave money to the Department of Education, and I believe the Department of Education also provided some money. Um, and then uh, the program was renewed. Multiple, we still have regional nurses. The program was renewed multiple times, um, but Colorado Health Foundation really turned their focus to childhood obesity, um, and we did that for a year, but really wanted to go back to chronic disease management. So um, I guess I would say it's a combination of um, grant money and government money. I, I do not believe there was any uh, federal. Great, thank you. That's um, helpful, helpful information to have. Um, I'm going to briefly answer a couple questions that have come in. Um, one is wanting to know why Healthy Schools Campaign no longer does the school nurse leadership program, um, which we're very sad we no longer do. Um, we unfortunately um, ran out of funding for the program, um, but a lot of the information that we learned from it is available on our website. Um, there's also a number of other fantastic leadership programs out there. Um, there's one run out of Rutgers called the Johnson & Johnson School Health Leadership Program, um, which we can certainly include a link to in our follow-up email, um, and some, some other great programs out there. Um, and again, we are, we are happy to speak with anybody who's interested in learning more about the program we ran. Um, and then somebody else wanted to know what the average rate of chronic absenteeism is in the U.S. in U.S. elementary schools. Um, and I, unless Kelly or Eva knows this, um, I'm not sure what it is specifically for elementary schools. I know nationwide the estimates range from five million to seven and a half million students being chronically absent. So I know. That's a big range. Um, there's some issues. Um, there's no consistent data set, on, national data set, on chronic absenteeism. So it's a little difficult to get an exact number, but um, it is certainly a, a national problem. Um, and as you can imagine, um, it's definitely students from low-income families um, are disproportionately more likely to be chronic absent. I think the rate is. Um, Students from low-income families are four times more likely to be chronically absent than their middle-class peers. Um, so I would recommend anybody that's interested in learning more about chronic absenteeism um, can check out uh, Attendance Works. is a wonderful organization that has some resources about chronic absenteeism and different um, tools that you can use in your community. Um, great. So then moving on another question. Um, for, um, I believe this one is for Kelly, um, wanting to know for the students with asthma, um, when you were looking at the absenteeism, um, were you, how, how were you pulling out, um, you saw the rate and the decrease in the rate of chronic absenteeism, was that specifically for students with asthma or was that students as a whole, um, the, I believe was, that decrease that you shared? Yeah, no, it was specifically for students with asthma that, um, and, and we we put we put we had to enter that ourselves under um, infinite campus health conditions alert, um, and yeah, so that it, we only looked at the students um, with asthma. So it would be interesting to look at the rest of them. When I tried to get some more data about chronic absenteeism in Mapleton, it's hard because there's different definitions. Like, are we including excused and unexcused? So um, it, it's, hard, it's hard to say, but I can tell you Mapleton does have a high rate of uh, chronic absenteeism, but I, I truly was fo solely focusing on asthma. Great. Thank you. Um, and another question, Kelly. When you say allow parents to, opt to, um, to have an option to opt out of having medications at school, what does that entail for both parties? I probably shouldn't even talked about that, but we have a group <laughs> of parents that regardless of what we do, they do not want their kids to have medicine at school. And I'm, I'm sure other nurses have come across this. They're like, well, they don't really, they only have um, asthma problems when they're sick, and when they're sick, we'll keep them home. And um, so we are always saying, that we, you know, trying to get um, an inhaler at school 
school. But if that they go through that third time and they're still not um, wanting an inhaler at school, we, we take um, first aid guidelines and it's a flow sheet. Um, and it really is for the, we, we do not have nurses in the school, so it's really for the unlicensed people of how they should manage the kids at school if they don't have an inhaler. Um, and then uh, the parents sign that. So if, um, you know, if somebody came back and said, why don't you have an inhaler at school, we have it documented that the parent chose not to have that. Um, but it, it, that, it, there's good and bad to that. Um, and we certainly don't encourage parents to do that. We encourage them to have an inhaler at school or even self-carry and have an extra one in the health office. I hope Great, thank you. Yeah. Yes, no, I think that, that's a fantastic way of answering the question. Um, a question for Eva, um, wanting to know what interventions were used um, when you said intentionally focused on those students who are chronically absent? Well, it's really just naming and claiming, as we as we say. It's having an eye on those kids and then trying to figure out what's going on with them. So if we're talking about when we sit as a committee and, you know, we're going down through a list, we look and see, okay, how much has he missed, he or she, how are they doing in school, to the, you know, the nurse, is this a student you're familiar with? And you know, she'll tell whether she sees that student, has been seeing that student in her office or whether there's any health conditions that she's aware of and those are the kinds of things we talk about and you know has this child been to the family resource center or is this child being receiving a backpack of food on the weekends has this child had received assistance from the family resource center paying bills or, or things like that and a lot of times the principals and attendance clerks will have some information that the rest of us might not have um, Particularly in a high school where there's over a thousand students, when we we sit down and meet, the attendance clerk might have had several calls. She'll say, "Well, I've had several calls from this, and this mom says this child has asthma and he's been having lots of trouble." And the school nurse has never been made aware of that. And so it's just the interventions are always based on what we figure out as a group is going on with the child. If nobody knows anything then a lot of times we might we might go to the classroom teacher, depending on the age of the child, or we might just pull the child in themselves, just particularly if it's an older child, just to see what's going on. Because then you've got all those other issues you can get into, the bullying and all those social emotional issues that come, particularly as the kids start getting older. Um, so a lot of times it might be a conversation with the student themselves. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a couple people, Kelly, wanting to know um, if you could provide the, a sample of the asthma care plan form um, that we could share with folks. Would that be okay? Yeah, I, I, that would be great. Um, I, we, we've actually updated it and I think improved it. Um, and it's been multi-stakeholders, you know, doing that. Um, so where would I send that, Christy? Would, would you? We, yeah, so if you send it, what we'll do is um, Kelly will share it with Healthy Schools Campaign, and then we'll be sure that that gets sent out um, to everybody in the follow-up email. And again, the follow-up email will also include a recording of the webinar and a link to the presenter slide. So Kelly, if you can share that with us, we can certainly make sure it gets out to everybody. That's awesome. Um, Great. And the, yeah, um, yeah, okay, that, that sounds good. Um, it, it's also considered a medication authorization, so we don't require any other form because that has the five rights of medication administration, so that asthma health care plan is the only form we use. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we're going to do one more question um, before we wrap up. Um, just wanting to know, um, both from Eva and Kelly, um, what was the greatest barrier you faced in implementing your program and how did you address it? Well, from This is Eva and from my perspective the greatest barrier was is to get people beyond thinking of truancy. Um, in, in our community there's probably, well in the last couple of years there's been over a hundred truancy cases filed and people think that's the answer to children missing school is file truancy. Well, we're a small community, and the courts can't absorb 100 cases in a year. And so what happens to those kids? Well, nothing. There's, there's no 
um, recourse for missing that much school. And so we can't depend on people outside of the school district to fix the problem. But the biggest barrier was getting people to stop thinking in the truancy mindset. As long as they had a piece of paper, as long as they had an excuse, everything was okay because we are still losing them. And so in saying that, I want to say to everybody, don't ever um, minimize the value of having nurses in your schools. Anybody who works in schools knows that we need a nurse in every school every day. And, and it's these kinds of things that, that have to get moved to the front burner for people to understand you know, if, if a child's not at school, they don't learn. It doesn't matter what excuse they bring with them. Great. Thank you. And, and Kelly, do you have any thoughts on the greatest barrier you face? I do, um, but I would just like to repeat what Eva said, is that we really do need a registered nurse in every school. And every child deserves to have a registered nurse because she's going to help that child manage their asthma and the whole family manage their asthma. So I, I just would like to put an exclamation mark on that. Um, the greatest barrier for um, for us in Mapleton was really actually the health care providers because they were so used to just doing their own um, medication authorization form and then just um, pushing it out. So um, Jana Jones, my coworker, and I went around to all of our community providers. We have like five of the major ones and met with them and shared um, actually both the Colorado Allergy Health Care Plan and Asthma Health Care Plan and described it's very easy to complete, but you have to, you know, complete it correctly once to be able to do it. So um, we went around and tried to network. Um, we're, we're still, uh, a lot of our providers now utilize that, um, but we still have a few holdouts, like we have a very large Kaiser Permanente network, and um, we're trying to get that into into their program. Um, but that that really was the the biggest barrier. Great, thank you. Um, so I think with that, we are going to go ahead and and conclude. Um, just wanted to say thank you once again to Kelly and Eva for your incredible leadership um, in your communities and for taking the time to share with us the great work that you're leading. Um, and I would encourage those that are listening to the webinar, um, again, if you are a school nurse or know a school nurse that um, is just doing an amazing job in your community supporting kids' health, we would certainly encourage you to sign up to receive um, 16 school nurse leadership application um, so that individual can be recognized. Um, so thank you to everybody for taking the time to join us this afternoon, and um, thank you again to Eva and Kelly. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Thank Bye. You.